Your list of favorite movies isn't valuable, is it? It's suspected that Disney may have secretly shared subscribers' data, including details about the videos they watched and their personal information, with Facebook. Some people believe that a list of videos a person watches should be highly confidential. Judge Robert Bork is one such person. A law was passed preventing the sharing of movie lists called the Video Privacy Protection Act, or VPPA. The VPPA was created in 1988 to prevent what it refers to as wrongful disclosure of videotape rental or sale records, or similar audiovisual materials to cover items such as video games and the future DVD format. Congress passed the VPPA after Robert Bork's video rental history was published during his Supreme Court nomination and it became known as the Bork Bill. It makes any videotape service provider that discloses rental information outside the ordinary course of business liable for up to $2,500 in actual damages. If you have a million subscribers, that's a serious chunk of change. When Robert Bork was nominated for the U.S. Supreme Court in 1987, a reporter asked his local video store assistant for a photocopy of handwritten entries of Judge Bork's rental history. The reporter then published these records under the heading The Bork Tapes along with a cartoon of Judge Bork on the cover, beer in hand, slouching in an armchair in front of the television. People wanted to know what the Supreme Court nominee had been watching. Unfortunately, there was nothing controversial. Judge Bork's rental records listed only garden-variety films like Risky Business, Ruthless People, and Footloose. This incident nevertheless spurred a privacy outrage, and especially among elected officials. Within months, the VPPA was debated in Congress, and California Congressman McCandless spoke in favor of the bill. There's a gut feeling that people ought to be able to read books and watch films without the whole world knowing. Books and films are the intellectual vitamins that fuel the growth of individual thought. The whole process of intellectual growth is one of privacy, of quiet, and reflection. This intimate process should be protected from the disruptive intrusion of a roving public eye. What we're trying to protect with this legislation are usage records of content-based materials, books, records, videos, and the like. There is an element of common decency in this legislation. It is really nobody else's business what people read, watch, or listen to. But how did a law about video rental history become an issue for Disney today? In 2009, Joseph Malley, class action attorney in Texas, filed a lawsuit against the online DVD rental company Netflix over its release of data sets for the Netflix Prize, alleging that the company's release of the information constituted a violation of the VPPA. In 2012, Netflix changed its privacy rules so that it no longer retains records for people who have left the site. This change was due directly to a lawsuit indicating violation of the act. In January 2013, President Barack Obama signed into law H.R. 6671, which amended the Video Privacy Protection Act to allow video rental companies to share rental information on social networking sites after obtaining customer permission. Netflix had lobbied for this change. To this day, when a Netflix consumer wants to share their viewing history with the accounts of their Facebook friends, an indicator on the Netflix site provides notice of the actual use by Netflix of their data. So what information does Disney collect and what do they share? Let's have a look at the privacy policy. According to PC Magazine, Disney Plus has the worst privacy policy. It's the most difficult to read by far, receiving just 2.8 out of 100 on a readability difficulty score, resulting in the most unreadable privacy policy in the U.S. Even Forbes agreed that when comparing privacy policies, the worst offender was Disney, whose policy, while short, had a very difficult readability score, with some sentences as long as 48 words and taking an average of 20 minutes to read. Why is it difficult? It's full of general language that makes it hard to pin down exactly what Disney does and does not collect and keep. Disney collects personal identifiers like name, email, address, government IDs, personal characteristics like gender, age, race, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, military veteran status, marital status, national origin, and medical information. It also collects information about your interests in consuming history or tendencies such as products or services considered, including payment information, information provided in response to surveys, and information you provide in public forums. 
Disney also collects internet or other electronic network activity information, including information regarding your interactions with us online and information we obtain from third parties about use of our applications on third party platforms or tasks. Disney also collects internet or other network activity information, including information regarding your interactions with Disney online and information obtained from third parties about the use of applications on third-party platforms or devices. Geolocation data, including precise location provided by a mobile device. And inferences based on the above. Disney combines data to get a pretty good idea of your income, race, life stage, health issues, etc. Like you can make judgments about people based on their outward appearance and mannerisms, but just more accurately. We collect information from you when you request services from us, participate in public forums and other activities on our sites and applications, respond to guest surveys, visit our physical properties, or call on the phone. We collect information through a variety of technologies such as cookies, flash cookies, pixels, tags, software development kit. We collect information using analytics tools, including when you visited our sites and applications. We acquire information from other trusted sources to update or supplement the information you provided or we collected automatically, such as when we validate postal address information using third-party services. You can opt out, but by default, you are opted in. Also, if you clear your cookies on your browser or use another browser, you may need to opt out again. The app is a little bit different. It collects and shares location, approximate location, and precise location, personal info like name, email address, and user IDs, purchase history, app interactions, and in-app search history, crash logs and diagnostics, device or other IDs. We will not share your information outside of the Disney companies with the exception of... When you allow us to share your personal information with another company by electing to share your personal information with carefully selected companies so that they can send you offers and promotions about their products or services. When you direct us to share your personal information with another company to fulfill your requests, such as when you book travel packages or when you book dining reservations. We also share when you direct us to share your personal information with third-party sites or platforms such as social networking sites. Please note that once we share your personal information with another company, the information received by the other company is controlled by that company and becomes subject to the other company's privacy practices. When we cooperate with financial institutions to offer co-branded products or services to you such as our co-branded Disney Visa Rewards Card, However, we do so only as permitted by applicable law. When you provide personal information to National Geographic partners, they control the information and could share it further. When you use the Hulu service, Hulu controls the information and can share it further. When we share your personal information with third parties in connection with the sale of a business to enforce our terms of service or rules, to ensure the safety and security of our guests and third parties, to protect our rights and property and the rights and property of our guests and third parties to comply with legal process, or in other words, if we believe in good faith that disclosure is required by law. So that last one, that's 75 words, <laughs> one sentence. And basically, it comes down to they can share your personal information for practically any reason. They could easily justify the sharing by some kind of safety or security issue. Basically, they can keep the information for as long as they like. The data transferred is fully anonymized, so it can no longer be associated with any individual. And that's it for the privacy policy in a nutshell. First of all, de-anonymization. You might be wondering, if, trans if the transaction data is anonymized, how can data brokers link it back to you? It's really quite simple. Banks and credit card services use third-party companies for anonymization or tokenization. These third-party companies assign your credit card a randomly generated ID code or token. Tokens are not mathematically reversible with a decryption key. However, a combination of a few receipts and social media posts is usually enough to connect your credit card transactions with other personal information. In a 2014 investigation, the Federal Trade Commission found that data brokers use credit and debit card transaction data to place consumers into various categories like Bible lifestyle, plus size apparel, and modest wages. This might not be to your liking since the data brokers are characterizing your behavior based on immutable characteristics, something the government is explicitly prevented from doing 
by the Bill of Rights. Data companies can make inferences from data that they've collected or purchased. A Slate article highlights the opportunity of these inferences. Sometimes inference is simple, like seeing which apps are installed on a device. If someone has a Christian news app or a Muslim prayer app on their phone, that's likely a strong indicator of their religion. The presence of LGBTQ dating apps on a phone, similarly, is likely a strong indicator that said person belongs to the LGBTQ community. A data broker could purchase user lists from the app or acquire data about a device's app downloads another way and use that single data point to mark down a person's religion and sexual orientation, which it can then sell. Other times, inference could be more complex. Part of the invasiveness of gathering location data is that it can be used to follow individuals as they visit medical facilities, divorce attorneys, payday loan offices, gay bars, places of worship, their children's school, and much more. Data brokers with thousands of data points on a single individual can also build models to derive additional information from that data. So what's so personal about your movie history? Who cares if anyone knows? Here's an example of nine movies that people are embarrassed to admit they like. Bring It On, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, Dirty Dancing, Not Another Teen Movie, Baby's Day Out, Howard the Duck, Titanic, Mean Girls, and The Notebook. So I asked ChatGPT what kind of characteristics a person liking those films would exhibit, and it replied, escapism, a strong, strong preference for romantic and dramatic films like The Notebook and Titanic, might suggest a tendency towards escapism, where the individual seeks refuge in an idealized or dramatic narrative to avoid dealing with real-life challenges. Over-idealization of relationships. Enjoying deeply romantic films could also lead to unrealistic expectations in relationships, constantly seeking the kind of intense, all-consuming love often depicted in these movies. Resistance to seriousness or depth. A leaning towards light-hearted and comedic films like Bring It On or Not Another Teen Movie might indicate a reluctance to engage with more serious, thought-provoking content, possibly reflecting discomfort with deeper emotional or intellectual challenges. Nostalgia-driven discontent. If there's a strong no nostalgic element to their movie choices, such as a preference for teen or coming-of-age films, it might suggest difficulties in dealing with the realities of adult life or idealization of the past, leading to discontent with the present. Preference for formulaic stories. A taste for mainstream and popular films might indicate a tendency to prefer stale, formulaic narratives over more challenging or innovative stories, possibly reflecting a lack of openness to new and diverse experiences. And quirky for the sake of quirkiness, so a liking for offbeat films such as Howard the Duck might sometimes veer into a contrarian stance, where the preference for the unconventional becomes more about standing out than genuine enjoyment. As you can see, this list might help predict the products that you would want to buy, but also provide inferences about your personality that go into much more personal realms. Leave a list of your favorite movies in the comments down below, and I'll tell you what kind of personality you have and what kind of products you might buy in the near future. If you like this content and it was helpful, please like and subscribe.